I would like to welcome everyone to this event, The Dark Side of Food Writing, a reading by Irina Dumitrescu, who's here with us today from the University of Bonn in Germany. It's made possible through the support of the Department of English and uh, the Food Studies theme. And I wanted to particularly thank Sherry Graydon and Beth Quisland of the English Department, Teresa Moran and Ella, uh, sorry, Anna Clay Clayboon of Food Studies, who designed the fabulous posters that I'm sure you saw. And um, those two actually have provided a lovely reception for us after the talk. Um, and also Din T. W. Moore, the director of creative, the, the creative writing program here at Ohio University. All these people encouraged me to uh, bring Irina here and made it possible for us to do so. But the reason I'm really up here tonight is to introduce Irina Dumitrescu. I know Irina's writing in two capacities. As many of you here do, I know her through her creative nonfiction, the beautiful prose of My Father and the Wine, which appears in this year's Best American Essays collection. I know her through her wry observations. The hipsters are raising chickens and slaughtering them at home, I read. The hipsters are distilling hooch, she writes in the beginning of that essay. And there's that sense of instant recognition. Who didn't move to Brooklyn and do something just a little crazy or dream of it at one point? Irina's great gift in her nonfiction, and perhaps the great gift of all good nonfiction, is perhaps the most important and least practiced skill of modernity, the art of careful observation. She writes about bad food, meatloaf and mac and Cheetos and currywurst. And when she writes of these somewhat eclectic delicacies, she evokes the fleeting taste of our own past, the fried peanut butter and jelly that was dad's special treat when mom was out of town. Its recollection made all the sweeter and saltier and fattier by the ability of a writer to recreate the simplicity of that gorgeous lost artifact. Or in her essay, The Things We Take, The Things We Leave Behind, her ability to recreate the urgency of the nearly overwhelming need for the collection of things. And this is also from her essay. The sheer inconvenience of having to pack up 50 spice bottles or 300 belly dance DVDs seems to be a promise of stability, an assurance that we will stay in one place. This time we will not move again. We will find a perfect storage spot for our pet objects, arrange them in alphabetical order, and allow them to acquire a cozy layer of dust. In these lines, Irina once again teases out the deeper sense in our quotidian world to create, in this reader at least, the recognition of something so deeply ingrained it has escaped notice until her author's pen defines its contours. But I said at the beginning of this that I know Irina's writing in two capacities. I knew Irina first as a scholar, a fellow student and lover of old English language and poetry. And if there's one thing I know about Frau Dr. Dumitrescu, it's that her favorite genre from the Middle Ages is the enigmata, the riddle, one of the most popular pedagogical forms of the early Middle Ages. And this is where, for me, her scholarly work offers an insight into her creative work. Like the old English authors she studies, Irina creates writing that both rewards repeated reading and is itself the product of repetition, of careful thought and study. Whether she's teaching me, us, about esoteric Old English poetry or the cherished, delicious artifacts of our own past, Irina takes what would otherwise be ordinary and makes it startling, vibrant, and new, a gift and a lesson well worth having. And so, Irina Dumitrescu. Thank you so much for having me. I don't think I can really live up to that introduction. I think that was our high point for tonight. So <laughs> now you'll have to bear with the rest of it, which, uh, which can't quite be that good. Um, but I, um, first of all, I hope you hear me. I know this, this room is maybe not the best for sound. So if at some point you don't hear me, wave frantically, <laughs> scream, throw yourself to the floor, and then I'll know to project a little better. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dinti. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mary Kate is right. I, I, what she didn't say about my academic writing is that I often like to look for the dark sides of things. I look at teacher-student relationships and look at the pain and suffering involved, not at how everything works out hunky-dory. Um, I'm interested in, in the things that are often unsaid or, um, or undescribed or under, underneath the surface. This is why I love the riddles. And 
I've often, I, for a long time, I've been reading food writing as a secret pleasure, especially through grad school. I would always read food histories, um, books about food, food blogs. And I became very frustrated with them at some point. I even tried to write my own food blog and quit. And part of the reason was that they were too perfect. I was reading about perfection everywhere. I was reading about beauty. I was looking at images that were perfectly styled and to which I could never live up in my own cooking or in my own life. It always felt like I would really just never measure up to the image I was having, I was getting from, from these stories and um, blogs and of course TV shows about food. So I became a little bit angry at this and I often write out of anger. Uh, I became angry not only because I couldn't live up to it, I couldn't take those beautiful pictures because I worked during the day and I, I couldn't set things up in the sunshine outside. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to write about food the way the bloggers did or the professional writers did. But I also became angry because I thought to some extent, even though they were trying to recover food for a lot of North American, the North American population, they also made it seem inaccessible to many. You had to, you had to reach a certain standard of perfection to participate in the world of food, it seemed, on a certain level at least. And I have friends who refuse to cook because they can't do it as well as they might have in a restaurant or they might see on a blog. I thought this was terrible because that's not how food should be. Food should be practice. Food should be fun. Food should be exercise. Um, cooking should be an area where it's possible to make mistakes. And so the first piece I'm going to read tonight is my manifesto, and it's really meant to be angry and uh, and a kind of call to arms to rescue, uh, to rescue bad food. But it's become a, a beginning of an interest in fighting against perfection in many different ways. And actually in my other writing too, I'm, I'm writing about dance. Uh, right now I might be writing about language learning soon. I'm, I've become very interested in the ways perfection doesn't serve us or doesn't serve us well. The ways perfection stops us from doing exciting or beautiful or rewarding things. And I think that's true for parenthood, too, where the, the search for perfection can be absolutely destructive. And it's, and it's true in a lot of areas of life, and a lot of things that have to do with the body, too. And I've grown to love cooking because it's a way of making, a safe way of making mistakes, and of becoming accustomed to making mistakes. You go into the kitchen, you make something, maybe it turns out terrible, it's okay, you put some ketchup all over it, you eat it, the next day you start over. So that's going to be the first piece. And in the second piece that I will read, which will be a, a slightly shorter version of an essay I published a few years ago on Texas food, uh, you'll see a little bit, not, not quite the belligerent voice of my first essay, but you'll see a little bit of my interest in food, and especially bad food or ungainly, imperfect food as a window into culture, and how I think that works almost as a better window to culture than Pache MFK Fisher writing about how wonderful food was in Dijon, right? Or, or the review of Le Bernardin, right? I think, I think we can write culture in much more interesting ways if we look at strange things that we eat. So that's enough introduction. Let me begin with my manifesto. We live in a time of food perfectionism. Experts shout culinary commandments from every direction. Daily meals, they say, must be ethically sourced, organic, raw, gluten-free, meat-free, dairy-free, protein-rich, low-fat, low in sodium, carbon-neutral, dirt-encrusted, pre-soaked, and fair trade. It can be hard to keep track of all these contradictory gastronomic rules. On the one hand, cooking should be simple and traditional, something our great-grandparents could recognize. On the other, food should be chef-inspired, executed with masterful knife skills in a professional great kitchen. One should eat with family, clinking wine glasses over a long table in a Tuscan garden. One should eat alone, undistracted, carefully controlling for portion size. We ought to eat like cavemen, nuts, roots, and seeds. We ought to eat like spacemen, foams, 
and sous vide. And by no means should anyone eat sugar because sugar is poison and grandma is trying to kill us with those cookies. <laughs> At the same time, there appears to be growing interest in food that breaks rules. On blogs, in Facebook groups, in listicles and in tumblers, people are celebrating bad food. Dishes that are disastrous, unattractive, or just plain unhealthy. Some poke fun at the mishaps of chefs, bakers, and cookbook authors, like the website Cake Rex, with its pictures of tragically ambitious professional cakes. <laughs> Other online collections, like the Gallery of Regrettable Food and Vintage Food Disasters, are filled with scans of disgusting-looking concoctions from old cookbooks. Websites like Someone Ate This, <laughs> celebrate the failures of home cooking in triumphantly unappetizing photos. Even Martha Stewart, who made a generation of homemakers feel inadequate, has been tweeting revolting photos of her meals to general delight and horror. <laughs> Why has bad food become so popular? Didn't Julia and Alice and Jim and Marcella teach modern home cooks to draw on the best that continental cuisine had to offer? to buy fresh, local ingredients and treat them with respect? Which part of the culinary revolution was it that led to deep-fried lasagna rolls or mac and cheetos? At a time when blogs, YouTube videos, and specialized cookbooks can help even a novice produce respectable results in the kitchen, why are folks turning to 1960s recipes to make jelly chicken and busy lady beef bake? Often, the more stomach-turning, I made nothing up for this, by the way, it's all research-based. <laughs> Often, the more stomach-turning the dish, the more gleeful the prose about it, as if making terrible food somehow maintained the noble tradition of human ingenuity and experimentation. Once, humanity asked if it could walk on the moon. Now, it aims to recreate the nightmare of tuna and jello pie. The current Rabelaisian, Rabelaisian relish for outrageous food is at least partly a playful rebellion against the excesses of gastronomic prescriptivism. After decades of being warned against butter, salt, coffee, chocolate, wine, and anything else that makes life on this miserable planet worth enduring, food lovers learn they are healthful after all. In fact, it was the foods we replaced them with, margarine, energy drinks, artificially sweetened desserts, that were deadly. Oops. In the face of rapidly changing scientific recommendations, it feels liberating to throw caution to the wind and deep fry a Big Mac, or at least fantasize about doing it. And then there are aesthetic standards. It's one thing for magazines and cookbooks to have polished photography and food styling. They are professional productions, and most reasonable people do not expect what they cook in their home kitchen to turn out looking at exactly like it did in Bon Appetit. But food blogs, Instagram, and Pinterest are also filled with glossy, sunlit photos of organic mason jar meals and caramel-drizzled cupcakes. Theirs is a dark beauty. They suggest that home-cooked food could look that luscious, that perfect, given a little care and knowledge. In most cases, this is impossible. The majority of people who cook do so under limiting conditions. Tired after a day's work, in haste, on a budget, to please a child's picky palate, using leftovers with processed ingredients without the special oil or herb that would have required a trip to a distant supermarket. They serve their meals on actual plates, not on slate slabs or rustic <laughs> chopping boards. <laughs> their food is tinged yellow or blue depending on the light bulb they eat it under. Real homemade food often looks like failure, but it's not. Feeding yourself or others is a success, an act of love, even when the meal resembles unappetizing brown mush. This is why it's ne sometimes necessary to celebrate culinary disasters. They reveal the reality of cooking, tedious but necessary chore, creative outlet, daily ritual. There's also something deeper to the current fascination with bad food, whether it's unhealthy, inelegant, unpopular, or just plain ugly. Food serves a variety of purposes, only one of which is nutrition. Shared meals strengthen communities, while food restrictions serve to keep groups of people apart. Culinary preferences signal one's class, 
ethical stance, or outlook on the world. The foods we eat, and especially the ones we talk about eating, tell others how we understand our bodies. Sensitive or resilient, hardworking or overflowing, rebellious or disciplined. In short, food offers ways of telling stories about who we are and where we come from. And bad food does this better than good. Jay Rayner, the Observer's restaurant critic, recognized that terrible food makes for good narrative when he collected his harshest reviews into a slim volume titled My Dining Hell, which I recommend. It's a very fun read. Excellent restaurants are all alike, he points out in his book, a curse for the critic forced to find fresh ways of describing a yawningly pleasant experience. It is indeed easy for descriptions of good food and happy culinary memories to become cloying, as so many food blogs prove. How many more scrumptious, luscious desserts or meltingly tender meats can readers stand to hear about? How many more inspirational grandmas tending to the stove? Badness, on the other hand, is specific and endlessly varied. There are so many culinary catastrophes, each one with its own individual meaning. In the kitchen, it's easy to founder in telling ways, with ingrained habits leading to strange fusions and awkward flavors. When I was growing up in Toronto, in Toronto, my mother would occasionally try her hand at a Chinese stir fry. Despite the Food Network's best effort, efforts at in, instruction of the masses, her stir fries always tasted suspiciously like the Romanian food we usually cooked. No amount of soy sauce could take them out of the Balkans. <laughs> One day, I visited a friend whose Indian-born mother announced she would make, what else, a stir fry. I laughed when I tried the result, a saute that resembled ever so slightly a curry. In their enthusiasm for the new, our mothers drew on the old, the familiar spices and techniques that gave their cooking an accent. Even more revealing are the intentional monstrosities, those dishes eaten alone, late at night, generally in front of a screen, or perhaps with a relative or friend who shares the same predilection. I recently asked my friends about the meals they eat when nobody's looking their secret gastronomic loves. The answers came fast and thick. People like to confess to odd proclivities, and I began to notice a few patterns. Many of my friends' guilty cravings are for wallops of in predictably intense flavor. Nutella or peanut butter eaten straight from the jar, ketchup on everything, endless applications of Vegemite. They admit to loving processed food, cheese balls, fun dip, Fruit Loops, Little Debbie Tree Cakes, Instant Mashed Potatoes with Bacon and Cheese Eaten Dry from the Packet. <laughs> they like the intensity of burnt toast, popcorn, even chocolate, and the kick of weird combinations like Doritos dipped in soft boiled eggs. <laughs> Ponder that for a moment. <laughs> These are foods that speak of abandon of a sensibility beyond diets and refined taste. One woman wrote that she loved drunk food, cheap, greasy pizzas and street meat, because it reminded her of eating what she wanted without guilt. The vast majority of responses were also connected to childhood memories, usually carb rich. Macaroni and cheese, processed, not homemade. Ramen, preferably the cheap kind. Wonder Bread sandwiches filled with potato chips, sugar, or nonpareils. Men, in particular, seem to have a talent for pleasing kids and grandkids with strange improvisations when women are out of the house. Respondents told me about the toast with cinnamon and sugar dad made for breakfast, or the mashed potato sandwiches with mint sauce that were a grandfather's specialty. Most interesting, to me at least, and most varied, were foods that people associated with the places they came from. I do not know if fried bologna and ketchup sandwiches are really a Buffalo, New York thing, as one woman insisted, or if Hormel Vienna sausages on white bread with mustard are typical of Mississippi. What struck me was that people held on to the memory of these simple sandwiches as a marker of home. A German friend recalled pressing a Mars bar into a hot bread roll bought from the local bakery and inhaling the gooey treat in seconds. A friend from Russia thought back to the raw onion salad dressed only with mayonnaise that she made for herself when there was nothing else to snack on. 
by now it should be clear that there is in fact no such thing as bad food. There's only food somebody else considers bad. People craft identities and relationships through such differences in taste. In college, two friends and I took advantage of a local store's six-topping special to develop a pizza we considered divine. It featured chicken, roasted red pepper, hot peppers, feta, pineapple, and extra cheese. And when other students came to our dorm room to bum a slice, they left after one look at the pie. Naturally, the pizza became a great source of bonding, a meal only we three could love. What's more, so-called bad food is often intensely good. Martha Stewart defended her hideous food tweets by saying the meals were delicious, and she was right. Ugly pictures are a reminder that food can taste wonderful and be deeply nourishing even when it's not styled for a photo shoot. How a dish looks tells us little about how it tastes, especially since the long cooking that produces complex flavors often also results in uncomely mush. On the other hand, food that's bad because it breaks rules can offer an unexpected thrill. In the language of food, some of you might know this book, it's a very fun read. The linguist Dan Jurafsky explains the fad for bacon ice cream as a pleasurable violation of American food conventions. Pork should be in the main course and dessert ought to be sweet. So combining them feels rebellious and fun. This kind of playful fusion is trendy, but it's also, as Jurafsky points out, how culinary innovation happens. It's a cliche by now that food is culture. But it needs to be added that much of what is important about culture lies in marginal cooking. People so often look to the highs to understand their relationship with food, but they also need to look to the lows. This, I propose, is what lies behind the fascination with food that breaks rules. Weird food is so often personal, the result of home cooking and experimentation in the kitchen. Bad food speaks to individual tastes, to the awful combinations people invent and eat when they're on their own. Junky, sweet, and processed treats recall the freedom we enjoyed as children. And unorthodox food can reflect our identities and histories, from the pig parts that our ancestors set in jelly to the meatloaf only mom could burn right. All right. So that was my, my call to arms, me, me being angry at the world of perfectionism. Um, the next piece is, is a slightly more personal essay, which again, I'm giving to you in a little bit in shortened form. Um, I've moved around a lot, as you will learn from the beginning of uh, the essay. I've, at this point, I've lived in five countries. And so a lot of my writing in some way or another comes around to the question of how I make a home for myself um, and how I might find points of connection to the places where, where I find myself. I lived for three years in Dallas, Texas. That was my first job. And at that point, when I moved to Dallas, I thought that I had, I thought I was pretty sophisticated. I thought I'd seen a lot of places. I'd been to Montreal, New York City, Bucharest, Toronto. I knew it all, right? Dallas was a culture shock. It showed me how little I actually <laughs> had experience of the world and experience of North America. And the funny thing about it was that it wasn't completely different. It was often strangely familiar. Um, this had partly to do with the geography of the city and the way it was set up in a, partly in a grid pattern. And it often had to do with the food because Dallas, of course, also has a high um, immigrant population as my hometown of Toronto does. And I found a kind of comfort in the mixing I, I saw in Texas and in, in Dallas more specifically. So this was an essay um, in which I tried, to, I tried to come to terms with some of the stranger aspects of Texas cooking as I observed them and also to find myself in them. When asked what Texas is like, I usually say it is the most exotic place I have ever lived. Before moving here, I spent some time in the northeastern United States, in Toronto, Berlin, and Bucharest, to say nothing of a few dimly remembered years wandering the desert in Israel. Texas is like none of these. The grandeur of its sky is unlike anything I've ever seen, a vast serene blue unblemished by a single cloud. 
Under this enormous canopy, people rush, ensconced in metal carapaces, fast and fierce automotive cockroaches, scurrying away from the unforgiving sun and the occasional wonder of a perfect double rainbow. But precisely because of its strangeness, this place also reminds me of my other homes in fleeting, warped, barely communicable moments of recognition. When I was little and directed my obsessive tendencies towards sticker collecting, some of the rarer specimens were holograms. From an oblique angle, I could see an image printed on the glossy foil, absurdly colored and bent along the curvature of the paper it decorated. This double reaction, momentary thrill at the glimpse of something hidden and familiar, and simultaneous recognition of its peculiarity, is constant in my new home, especially when it comes to the food. The early medieval monks whose scribbles I spend my days studying imagined reading to be like eating. Books were to be tasted, slowly savored in the mouth. Like bees, they roamed among fields of textual flowers, transforming pollen into sweetness in their little cells. Like cows, they ruminated, digesting and regurgitating scripture, incorporating its poetry into their very being. But we live in base and literal times, and so I read new places by eating my way through their strip mall sushi their street tacos and dumplings, their hole-in-the-wall falafel joints. An exile a few times over, I'm drawn to the edges and corners of a city's geography, those places where immigrants tuck small markets that sell smoked meats and jars of neon pickles, or restaurants where oil-filmed curry is served on styrofoam plates. I love these places, love observing how their owners adapt their cuisines to local tastes, Love making unnecessary trips to the bathroom when the staff takes its meal at the back of the restaurant so I can pick into the, peek, not pick, peek into their dishes and see what they eat. The cheap food of a city is a key to its soul, and the difficulty of getting to it is a good indicator of how much spiritual exercise is necessary to touch the essence of the place. Because there's little walking in Texas, you're unlikely to ramble by chance into Chinatown or by a three-table restaurant with no online presence. Even when driving aimlessly along main roads, something I did often in my first year in Dallas, it's hard to see the treasures hidden in strip malls along the road. Usually this is due to the big box, big chain stores stamped across the landscape, obliterating anything small from view. Sometimes though, it seems as though any signs of differentiated life have sought shade in dark corners, as though protecting themselves from the merciless Texas sun. Early on, Susan, a journalist friend who shares my love for out-of-the-way ethnic food, took me to a little place that produces and sells injera, the spongy bread that serves as both plate and fork in Ethiopian cuisine. Getting there involves driving down an industrial road called Jupiter, I assume due to its distance from human civilization. <laughs> the store is in the corner of what looks like an abandoned strip mall, completely unmarked and invisible from the road. For about three hours, every Sunday afternoon, if you know how to get there, you have your choice of dark and light brown injera, and gallon-sized bags of unroasted coffee beans. Peek beyond the counter and you catch a glimpse of long stainless steel tables on which bread is being prepared for sale here and in select gas stations across the city. Chat with the sales lady a bit and she will tell you that before 9 a.m. during the week you can drive into the alley behind the store and knock on a particular door to get your fix of injera. Now, I think eating injera is like chewing on a moist dish rag but knowing that I now possess the secret to buying freshly made floppy bread any day of the week, that unlike my benighted friends and colleagues who have spent decades in Dallas without a reliable purveyor of the stuff, I could make a bloody bed of injera, a, a fluffy bed of injera, and sleep in it should I so desire, gives me an incredible sense of empowerment. And more practically, I can foresee a variety of apocalyptic scenarios in which ready access to five kilo bags of coffee beans could come in pretty handy. If the culinary soul of my Texas is concealed, hard to discern among the fast food joints, taquerias, and strip club lunches I see advertised along its highways, it is also profoundly mixed. This bare fact comes as no surprise in an immigrant nation, or in a state with an amusement park named after the six national flags that have fluttered in its winds. It is the quality of the mixing that stands out for me. Growing up in Canada, I learned that national identity could, could be expressed in a single food simile. The Canadian alternative to the American melting pot, 
that pureed soup where, in which immigrants lose their precious uniqueness and forget even how to pronounce their own last names, is a fresh, crisp, partly seasoned salad. Our ethnic diversity is raw, nutritious, and blends in your mouth, not your plate, so holds the Canadian political dream. And to a great extent, this is how I experienced it in Ontario. I could have Hong Kong-style high tea in Richmond Hill, or visit an izakaya in downtown Toronto, both without too many foreign ingredients interrupting the fantasy of realness. But Texas food betrays neither clear divisions nor complete assimilation. Chili is its ideal governing metaphor. A well-cooked stew that still needs chewing, with no clear consensus on what its ingredients are or should be, but plenty of passion and bravado on all parts. <laughs> the fusion in Texas cuisine is rough and ready, even ungainly in a charming sort of way. This is not high concept international cooking, not the dusting of sencha green tea or smoky Spanish paprika, an unwitting slab of tuna might suffer in a region with more refined pretensions. No, Texas cooking comes from years of Mexicans, Germans, Czechs, Native and Anglo-Americans rubbing up against each other in this vast space, exchanging condiments, and generally making do with what is available. It is a process I once saw live during a cooking class at Kalachandis, a Hare Krishna temple and restaurant in East Dallas. Mandrali Devi, the instructor, began the class with an hour-long explanation of the principles of Ayurvedic cooking and the properties of each authentic spice. She then named the precise breeds of chili pepper she would have used in India to flavor a dish, and then nonchalantly added, but here I just use jalapenos. <laughs> the fusion continues beyond ingredients and into cooking methods and the rituals of eating. On the northern outskirts of Dallas, a little Indian restaurant specializing in Hyderabadi cuisine advertises as its signature dish a deep fried spicy chicken appetizer that its owners invented, of course, in America. Bistro B, a Vietnamese joint, offers customers $200 if they can finish a bowl of noodle soup large enough to bathe a baby in. This is not, by the way, an authentic Vietnamese practice, I asked. <laughs> the logic of Texas cooking goes like this. Can it be eaten? If yes, then surely it can be eaten more easily if a tortilla is folded around it. <laughs> Has it been wrapped in a tortilla? If so, then add jalapenos to it or chicken fry it, or douse it in queso, or all of the above. If all of these steps have, taken, have been taken, it is time to consider the application of bacon. Hence the existence of maple bacon rolls, which have joined colaches, enchiladas, and good old American pies among the offerings at the Little Czech Bakery in the town of West Texas. Hence also that shining expression of the Texan genius, chicken fried bacon. This delicious snack of unintuitively juicy bacon under a crisp coating of batter demonstrates another lesson about local fusion. Any condiment, flavoring, or even beverage is, upon entering a deep fryer, transmogrified into a main dish. Thus, the Texas State Fair has sold fried butter, fried beer, fried Coca-Cola, and for visitors from the coasts, fried lattes. One of the most divine concoctions, and I'm not making this up, this was really, really good. One of the most divine concoctions I ever had at the fair was a large jalapeno stuffed with jilled guacamole, impaled on a stick, battered, deep fried, and drenched liberally with cheese sauce. That little kebab could be sent into space to show passing aliens both the advancement of our civilization and the steeliness of our will. You just don't mess with people who will do that to a pepper. <laughs> when I look at Texas straight on, I see the poorest boundary region between Mexico and the Anglo-American South. The suburbs of Dallas, viewed slant, remind me of the grids around Toronto. Orderly immigrant suburbias dotted with Chinese bubble tea shops and Russian groceries. A third perspective brings into relief the funhouse nostalgia that characterizes what has remained of German heritage in Texas, and probably much of the United States. Now let us be clear, I am fond of Germany. I am so fond of it that I married one of its citizens and have eaten salad made almost entirely of sausage, such as my dedication. 
But what I love about Germany has more to do with excellent public transit, Turkish döner, and a predilection for putting philosophers on television, <laughs> and precious little to do with the good old days of group singing and decorative beer steins. And so I became fascinated by places like Hans Müller Sausage, a beer hall on the grounds of the state fair that encapsulates the half-camouflaged way German culture abides in Texas. Sandwiched between the Cotton Bowl and a concert stage that actually has sport utility vehicles placed into its frame as decoration, Hans Müller entices visitors with a fluorescent purple and teal awning, aimed no doubt at three-year-old girls thirsty for a lager. <laughs> a step inside and the scene changes completely. Over tables crowded with beer-drinking, wurst-gobbling fairgoers hang large banners in black, red, and gold. Accustomed to modern Germans' understandable reticence about sporting the national colors, I'm taken aback to find them so brazenly displayed in Dallas. The hall's most prominent decorations, however, play on a different symbolic level. Flanking the main entrance are two man-sized sculptures of a sausage and a turkey leg, respectively both of which jut out of the wall at the angle of full tumescence and lure ominously over the crowd. <laughs> Hans Müller sausage is a compact expression of German-American Texan fusion, a manly temple to meat processed and meat au naturel under a hard pink candy shell. The riddle boast by Hans Müller piqued my curiosity, so when I found out that Texas also has a yearly Wurstfest every November, I knew I had to do some anthropological field work. As luck would have it, two friends were visiting me from Seattle and the Netherlands, and they were both the kind of women who could sew or procure a dirndl on short notice. So we got our dresses and off we went to South Texas. The new Brownfield Wurstfest was first held in 1961, and it offers today's visitor a glimpse into the ethnic nostalgia of the Texas Hill Country. It manages to be at once tediously similar to every other event of its kind, and outlandish in its amnesiac reach for the town's immigrant roots, and Germanic in quiet, uncanny ways that probably elude even the organizers' notice. The beer is Scheinerbach, and the people waiting in line for it look just like the folks at the Texas State Fair, only about a foot taller and naturally blonde. Dirndls and Lederhosen are everywhere, sartorial cliches that have somehow come to stand for all of Germany in the American imaginary, and which I can only imagine appearing in Hamburg or Stuttgart as part of some kind of avant-garde performance gone horribly wrong. The concessions include all the corny dogs, nachos, blooming onions, turkey legs, and fried pickles you need to show your arteries who's boss, along with food items whose hybridity recalls the twisted imaginary creatures of a medieval bestiary. Take the cheddar wurst, for example, or the jalapeno sausage, or the Reuben quesadillas, or most touchingly, the so-called German taco, a sausage resting innocently on a bed of sauerkraut, wrapped gently in a tortilla, blissfully unaware of its unspeakable nature. <laughs> the great dark secret behind the yearly salute to sausage is that despite its enthusiastic dedication to all things Wurst, the sausage itself is mediocre. But because my girlfriends and I took a taxi to the fest and not to the designated, not in the designated <laughs> Wurstwagen drunk van, the best worst round ride in town, we knew the unofficial story. Now, it is a particularly American talent brought by Texans to an apogee of decadent sophistication to put food on a stick. This is, I suspect, a veiled exegetical reference to the equally American practice of fashioning crucifixes out of unexpected materials like matchsticks or macrame. Our driver revealed to us what observation and experience confirmed. That the pork chop on a stick, marinated in well-spiced dark vinegar, grilled to moist perfection, its juices caught by a bread roll impaled just below it like some gloriously edible shroud of Turin, was the thing to eat at the festival. I did not try the shrimp on a stick, or the sausage on a stick, or the sirloin on a stick, or even the pickle sickles, which were invented, no doubt, to let the vegetable kingdom know it wasn't safe either. But the pork chop was indeed exquisite, like what would happen if a Rosbraten took off its clothes and went tubing down the Komal River on a stick. <laughs> the day after visiting the Wurstfest, having missed the showing of Batwurst, the adventures of Bratman and Robin, <laughs> like I said, I make nothing up. 
I only observe. We decided to explore a little more of New Braunfels food offerings. In Gourmage, a little shop filled with specialty cheeses and chocolate, the owner confessed to being a liberal. She did so with a kind of flustered trepidation one might used to say, I prefer to eat children en papillot. <laughs> Moreover, she had allowed her daughter to attend university in Seattle to the consternation of family and neighbors. So the suspicion of child abuse was clearly not far off. We walked by the worst craft show and sale in Texas and passed the Spaß and Gemütlichkeit mural, the fun and conviviality in this case referring mainly to sausage preparation. Our goal was the Friesen House restaurant, founded by an emigre North German family in 2003. 2005, sorry, which advertised real German bread, along with schnitzel, marinated herring, polka bands, beer steins, Sachertorte, loose tea, Leberkäse, Dirndls, Currywurst, Weißwurst, black forest variations on any dessert, along with any other food, clothing, or practice that could possibly be associated with any region of Germany, past or present. <laughs> to my surprise, the owner seemed unamused when I greeted him in German. Switching to English, I asked him if a lot of Germans came to the restaurant. His answer was curt. I came here to get away from them. I pondered whether this was utterly ridiculous or a strange sort of strategic brilliance on his part. In New Braunfels, Germans appear as semi-mythical omas and opas, running restaurants, leading festivals, pickling green beans, and generally keeping the freedom-loving revolutionary spirit of 1848 alive, one supposes. Germany is all past here. And it's a comfortable past, if a somewhat fattening one. It reminds me of the 2003 German film, Schulze Gets the Blues, in which the retired miner and accordion player, Schulze, travels from his village in Sachsen-Anhalt to New Braunfels to participate in the folk music competition. Once there, he sits beside the Wurstfest stage, and after a few polkas, some yodeling, and the Deutschland lead, quietly leaves. Schulze moves on to explore the bayous of Louisiana in search for the Zydeco that captivated him. The old German is in the United States because he has fallen in love with America's savage places and strange rhythms, not to see a distorted reflection of his own home. Why do I find an event like the Wurstfest uncanny, while the Korean, Indian, and Chi Chinese and Vietnamese restaurants on, around Dallas remind me of home? Is it that the first is the Disney version of a place I have lived in and even loved? while the others are simply the local analogies of other counterfeits I know from Toronto and New York? Or is it the relentless mythologizing in places like Hans Müller and New Braunfels, the way they blow up a bit of stuffed intestine to epic proportions and then bow down to worship it? The truth is, behind every immigrant is a tragedy. The tragedy may be great or dram and dramatic. War, genocide, famine, revolution. It may also be small composed from the daily sorrows of waiting in lines, boiling water for baths, and knowing that the love letter you hold in your hands has already been read by a government censor. It always includes the knowledge of irrevocable separation from home, from the family and friends whose lives continued along their courses after you left, a distance unbridgeable by travel because it does not exist in geography. The proper response to these remembered heartbreaks is to grit your teeth, Work hard, continue cooking that thing with the pig feet or cow intestines or sheep brains, that vaguely stomach-turning dish no one would eat if they had not grown up thinking it a delicacy, and remind your children every day about the sacrifices you have made for them and the desirability of attending medical school. <laughs> the immigrants I know continue their rituals and cuisines out of habit, not nostalgia, because they don't forget the reasons they left. The manic quality of the Wurstfest comes from the fact that it is, at its heart, a celebration of loss by people who have not lost anything themselves. Or maybe I think that foods of place and memory taste best when we abandon the dream of an authentic past and acknowledge that we'll improvise the spicing to suit the present. <coughs> I have come to love some foods intimately bound up with the geography of Texas and the Southwest, like a spicy crawfish boil which I first tasted in the midst of an epic winter storm that left roads strewn with broken tree limbs and large parts of Dallas without electricity. One of the tropes of Canadian emigre literature is the shock and delight immigrants from southern climes experience when seeing snow fall for the first time. But my own childhood in Romania was one of brutal winters and freezing temperatures indoors. 
15 years in Toronto, where the first snow portends eight months of unceasing brown slush, did not increase the novelty or pleasure of seeing frozen water drop from the sky. But that February, snow was new again. The Cajun seasoning burning my mouth and stinging under my fingernails, a perfect complement to the unexpected cold outside. It was in Dallas, with a belly full of mud bugs, that I first felt, felt the beauty of snow falling in the night, blanketing sidewalks and streets, forcing me to stay put for a bit. Thank you.